Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, today we are running a webinar um, through the My MTSS Technical Assistance Center, focusing on literacy learning and the SLP. Um, we have a few virtual expectations. Um, we are all very used to um, our time doing webinars over the last few years on Zoom. Um, overall, I would just love your participation and input. Um, I'm excited to spend the next couple hours together with speech pathologists from all over the state. Um, I'm looking forward to your input, your ideas, and collaboration. Um, a couple of housekeeping things um, for attendance purposes. Um, if you would just rename yourself um, so your first and your last name is available. Um, if you click on the participants icon in your toolbar, you should be able to rename yourself. So that's just going to be important for sketches um, and attendance. In your toolbar, participants. Okay. And then if you could have your computer muted, that would be helpful for background noise. <laughs> Um, we would love to understand your experience as a learner, um, and we want to ensure that our professional learning sessions are relevant, um, are of high quality, useful, and promote equity. So embedded at the end of our session today, we'll have some time to fill out a survey um, evaluating this session. And we have a little bit of a contest going on at the TA Center about who can get the most evaluations completed. So I am certain a group of speech pathologists will be willing to participate and help me win as a newbie employee. Um, and then today, our purpose. Um, I'm so excited you guys are here. Um, our purpose really is to dig into the relationship between literacy and speech and language. Um, I want to assure you right from the start that the intention of this webinar is to enhance the good things that you are already doing um, with your students. Um, I really don't want anyone walking away with um, stressors about added workload or increased caseload. Um, that is not my intention. Um, the material that we're gonna explore is really just to increase your knowledge base and enhance what you're already doing. Um, before we get any further, I think that's all our housekeeping stuff. Um, I wanna introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ferlito. Um, I am ASHA certified speech language pathologist. Um, I worked in the preschool and elementary setting um, in a public school district in Oakland County. And I had a small placement during that in the high school. Um, and then after that, I was a self-contained SLI classroom teacher. So this position was really unique. Um, and this is where I learned to love that bridge between literacy and speech and language. Um, I had a classroom with 10 to 12 students with very severe speech and language impairments and taught them all their academics in addition to speech and language. And that was in Macomb County, Michigan. Um, currently, I am a professional learning specialist here at the My MTSS TA Center. Um, I'm also a student. Um, I'm getting my doctorate in reading science at Mount St. Joseph University. Um, personally, I come from a pretty big Italian family. So this fourth picture is of me and my nani um, making homemade ravioli. And then lastly, I have a dog named Izzo, and I just couldn't proceed without putting her face on this slide. So that's me in a little nutshell. Um, I also would love for you to know Lisa Owens. She is another literacy learning specialist here at the Technical Assistance Center. Um, she's also a speech pathologist. And um, Lisa, do you wanna say hi? Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here co-hosting today. I'm going to be the one kind of monitoring the chat. Um, so if you need anything throughout the session, please let me know. I will do my best. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and send the slides and handout for today into the chat right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So if you need anything, feel free to private um, message Lisa. And Lisa knows to stop me dead in my tracks if um, something is not working correctly with the screen sharing and whatnot. 
Um, okay, so you know a little bit about us. I would love to know a bit about you all. Um, if you could use your annotate tool and put a stamp, you can choose a heart or a star and stamp where you live. It doesn't have to be exactly the correct county, um, but I thought it would be fun to see where everybody is from having um, a statewide um, professional learning session. Ooh, someone from the Upper Peninsula. I do know we have a friend um, who is not in Michigan. So if you are out of the state, you can just put your star or your stamp elsewhere around the map. Um, and of course, if you're driving, you can feel free to skip this activity. I want you to, you know, keep your eyes on the road and you can keep your ears with us. Thanks, Una. Una's over here. She is from... Um, she is from Toronto. So to go to the annotate tool, you are going to look for the stamp button. You're gonna click the more on your um, Zoom toolbar and you're gonna click those three dots and then you'll select annotate and then you'll select the stamp. So, so far, most people in Metro Detroit area, I'll stamp to where I am. For some reason, I don't have the three dots. Oh, if you look at the bottom, if you put your cursor just above your microphone, there may be a little like pencil icon that pops up. You can also access annotate right there. Did that pop up for you? Nope. My <laughs> not. I can't get it either. Or yeah, you, can, um, either. you can draw on it. Oh, bummer. So let's see. On mine, it's just on my Zoom toolbar. So I have the mute, the video, um, and then there's a pencil that clicks annotate, that says annotate. No, I don't have that. Oh, sad. Must, must be different Zoom settings. If you aren't able to tell us um, on the map where you're from, oh, I see someone just did on the west side of Michigan. Wow, look at our friends in the Upper Peninsula. Wayne County, thank you, Karen. Kalamazoo, Wayne County. Oh, that makes me sense. Kent County, welcome. Spring Lake. Oh, Mallory tried to add in the chat just a little explanation. She says, click on the view options to where it says that I am sharing my screen at the top if you're in full screen mode. Oh, so if, oh, I see a lot of um, stars. Do we have people here from Ohio? Because I see a lot of stars below Michigan. Do it. Okay, Rachel, I see that you got it. This was supposed to be a fun, quick activity, but I want you to be able to participate and tell me where you're from. <laughs> Okay, nice job, everybody. I'm going to clear the drawing so we can proceed. Thanks for um, participating. Oh, good. Okay, so now we're going to troubleshoot again. And I am going to um, ask you to take your phone and scan this QR code. Or you can go to www.menti.com and enter this code. Um, and you can tell me about um, what your job is. If you are a birth to five SLP, if you're an elementary SLP, and I will show the results um, on the screen. So I'm gonna give just a couple seconds more to grab this QR code. If um, if you don't grab the QR code, no biggie. The, um, the Menti um, website and code is in the chat. Thank you, Lisa. And we will be able to see who's here today. I had a feeling that most of us would be elementary speech language pathologists, a couple secondary. Um, and if you are an other, feel free to type in the chat what your position is. No psychologists or social workers. I wasn't super sure on that. Some general education teachers or in special education teachers, that's wonderful. Um, if you're here with your speech pathologist, that's amazing too. That'd be wonderful to be here with a team.
That's great. Thank you so much. Um, this professional development was designed for speech pathologists. So if you're not a speech pathologist, um, no sweat. Um, but there are some activities that are a little bit speech specific. So you might have to think creatively about some topics. Um, so we have three outcomes for today, um, for our time together. My goal is to offer some level of creativity for how we can support teachers, um, learn about some opportunities for push-in um, or co-teaching opportunities. And really, I just want us to capitalize on how time spent in speech therapy can be leveraged to support skills necessary for reading proficiency. So I would love for you to type in the chat um, what number you are most excited about, outcome number one, two, or three. <laughs> Lots of threes, okay. I promise we will get there. Awesome. So the field of speech pathology is incredibly vast, which all speech pathologists are very well aware of that. Um, the umbrella of our services is extremely wide, um, and we have a unique knowledge base in many areas. Um, there are a few areas that, that pop out to me when I read this ASHA statement. Um, first being emergent literacy and identifying children at risk. Um, SLPs have a great influence here because we are an early intervention provider many times. So we are able to see kids before they enter kindergarten. Um, and by being stronger in our literacy knowledge and being stronger literacy clinicians, we can send students to kindergarten with a stronger foundation. And then also as our literacy knowledge increases, we will be better at identifying those kids who are at risk sooner. So our goal really and then would be preventing those literacy difficulties. Um, prevention is ideal in all circumstances. The outcomes do outperform remediation. Um, and then the next point that kind of sticks out to me in this statement is about assisting general education teachers. Um, speech language pathologists are the experts in phonemes, the consonant chart, um, the vowel chart, how language impacts all academic areas. So it is extremely powerful to partner with our colleagues and spread this knowledge. And then lastly, advocating, right? Advocating and increasing that knowledge base. Um, who doesn't want a SLP as their advocate? Right. Um, I was my biggest advocate for my niece when she went through her feeding and speech development hurdles. Um, speech pathologists, they have a unique knowledge. We have a unique knowledge base, but sometimes we don't recognize that we have it. Um, I didn't really recognize that I had a knowledge base in feeding. Um, I It's absolutely not my area of expertise, but with my foundational knowledge of speech language pathology, I was able to hang in those conversations and with some education, really build my knowledge. Um, so with regards to literacy, we have increased literacy knowledge. And as we increase our knowledge, we just have to capitalize on what we already know and connect it to those evidence-based practices. So ultimately we can advocate for those best practices. Um, so we're gonna do one last mentee and I would love for you to scan the code. And I, there are gonna be three statements that you're gonna rate your confidence. So rate how confident you are um, in these three statements. Um, I personally had very low confidence in all three of these areas. So no matter where you are in your journey, it is absolutely okay. I'm gonna probably talk about my personal experience a lot throughout this webinar because that is how I grounded our activities. It's pretty much everything that I did, wish I knew that I didn't know. So I will share these results.
And as people reply, this will ebb and flow. So it's on a scale from either zero or one to five being high confidence. So everybody so far is kind of right in the middle. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. We have about probably 70% that's replied. I'll just give a couple more minutes to make sure people are having an okay time accessing the website. Um, I recently um, got in the mail um, the Misha conference program, and I was reading the descriptions, and there were a couple descriptions on literacy and speech language pathology. And one offering, I just read the description, and it said over a quarter of school based SLPs do not feel like they have expertise needed to provide services to students who struggle with reading and writing. Over a quarter. Um, so Katie Squires is actually leading that session. So I thought just that statistic was really interesting. And um, it just means we're, we're not alone. This is a tricky area. And um, we as SLPs um, have such a strong foundation to grow upon. So here is our agenda today. We are going to talk through the problem, talk about some evidence-based research, we're going to chat about dyslexia, and then we are going to get into what everybody wants to know is we're speech paths. How can I help? So first, we have to discuss the problem to know why we're here, why we're having this webinar, why is the internet um, talking so much about the science of reading, um, and why is it important for us as speech pathologists to get involved? Um, so we have to be able to better understand this problem in order to work towards solving it. So we have NAEP data, and this is, NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So it's managed by the National Center of Education Statistics through the U.S. Department of Ed. And information about the NAEP um, includes state-specific data, and it can be found on their website. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. You can um, um, divide data and get for just for Michigan, for just for certain areas. You can do it by demographic. There's a lot of different ways you can analyze the data. Um, reading data is collected every other year on students grades four, eight, and 12. Um, the sampling procedures are similar to um, that match the, the nation's census data collection. Every state also participates. Um, so it has two criteria levels that it looks at. Proficiency, um, we want all children to be proficient, um, ability, the ability to do academic work. And then it also looks at a basic level. And so a basic level is when we think about being able to read well enough to function in society. So let's say read a ballot and be able to vote. Okay, so basic level of literacy. So this slide shows that the NAEP data for 2022 um, looks at the number of children scoring below the basic level. So it's incredibly alarming. 37% um, of the nation's fourth graders perform below a basic level. Um, I recently um, attended a presentation by Dr. Carolyn Strom, um, and she shared this same type of information and translated it and said, our fourth graders have a one in three chance of learning to read in the United States. Um, and that is just makes my stomach hurt. Um, so in order to work towards solving this problem, we have to understand this problem. And more importantly, we also need to understand how someone learns to read if we are going to teach someone how to read. Um, and I, without a doubt, did not have this understanding when I began practicing as a speech pathologist. So that leads us into some research that is grounded in um, the simple view of reading and the reading brain. And these, these two discussions that we're gonna have is really going to ground our practice. Um, everything changed for me when I understood the simple view of reading, and then it changed for me a little bit more once I understood how the brain learns to read. So, 
The next four slides are based on the companion guide um, through the Essentials Practices for Intensifying Literacy document and also Tunmer and Hoover um, from 2019. So I, I'm assuming you have heard of the Simple View of Reading, but if you have not, that is absolutely okay. Um, it basically states that reading comprehension is the product of word recognition and language comprehension. You cannot have one without the other. I think about these as buckets. So I always say we have a word recognition bucket and a language comprehension bucket. Um, and so there are a couple of big ideas. Um, it is a multiplication equation. So that means that both parts matter. Um, although this is the simple view, um, the underlying processes are very complex. And so we will unpack each bucket in the following slides. And then the last thing that we'll chat about is that this process translates into a progression of skills um, to be taught. So good instruction must effectively integrate both the word recognition and language comp comprehension. Um, so we're not going to teach one over the other, right? They both have a place and they both are incredibly important if we want the outcome of reading comprehension. So here we're going to unpack the bucket of word recognition. So underneath this bucket of word recognition, we have the cognitive capacities that underlie it. So again, this is the simple view of reading, but all of these skills are very complex. Um, it basically describes what's going on in the brain. Um, even though it seems like a simple task of transforming print to the spoken word, um, this is very complex. And so a child needs to be, un be, able, be able to understand how print works and also how speech connects to print. So alphabetic coding skills refers to having both of these sets of knowledge. Um, concepts about print refers to our very basic understanding of how print works. Um, at its most basic level, a young child must learn that spaces separate words. Um, if the child is going to begin to match those words to, um, to speech. And then we have the knowledge of the alphabetic principle. And that's the second domain um, that plays into your alphabetic coding skills. So we need conscious awareness that letters and letter combinations are used to represent the phonemes underlying spoken words. So this has two domains of knowledge, letter knowledge and phonemic awareness. So letter knowledge is the ability to recognize and manipulate letters of the um, alphabet, including letters in different fonts, different case. Um, and then phonemic awareness, your ability to recognize and manipulate phonemes in spoken language. So that is our word recognition bucket. Then we can empty our language comprehension bucket. And these are all the cognitive capacities that are in this language bucket. So our literal understanding of what is being said is based on three knowledge domains. We have phonological knowledge, um, and that's starting with the acu acoustic signal being recognized as speech sounds um, for our language. Then we have syntactic knowledge, which parses out true meaning of phrases, clauses, and sentences. Then we have semantic knowledge. So that's um, our meaning of words, word parts, um, even phrases um, that take on their own meaning like piece of cake or walk in the park. So when we're trying to make sense of spoken language, our brains are combining the literal meaning of what's being said which we derive from our linguistic knowledge, um, combining that with our inferential understanding of what is being said, which is based on background knowledge. So these two sets of cognitive capacities is what is ultimately going to lead to language comprehension. So the simple view of reading is a framework for educators to understand what's going on in the brain when their students are reading. And then we need to apply that to understand what instructional decisions we should be making. So if a student has, you know, if we have reading comprehension that, that requires competence in both of these buckets, right? 
um, they ha these systems have to be connected in the students' brains through deliberate and repeated practice, um, and that is through interactions with language and print. So if a student can decode, they're going to get like a one, right? This is demonstrating how this is a multiplication problem. But they have no language comprehension or they don't have grade level language comprehension, they're not going to be able to comprehend what they read. And ultimately, that is the goal, right? Reading comprehension, gathering meaning from text is our goal. So if we have strong word recognition skills and weak language, ultimately, we're not going to have good reading comprehension. If we have a student with grade level comprehension but cannot decode, they're not going to understand what is read. And this is a typical pattern of a student who might be experiencing characteristics of dyslexia or word learning difficulties. So these two buckets, word recognition and language comprehension, are considered essential, and they inform what we teach and how we teach them. So it is incredibly important for us to try to get reading instruction right off the get-go for young children. Um, the research is, is very clear that reading failure can be prevented in kindergarten and first grade by teaching the skills within the word recognition bucket, within the language comprehension bucket. Um, but we should remember that these skills are not only important for young children, right? If we are working with a student who is older, who is struggling with reading comprehension, we should be investigating what is going on within their word recognition skills or within their language skills, right? So the simple view of reading serves as a framework for what we teach, what we assess, and ultimately how we're determining if a student is struggling with if they're not comprehending. Um, I will tell you that I probably saw the simple view of reading presented Oh, a handful of times before I saw someone write out the multiplication problem. And so I just think it's really important to be this explicit that one times zero is zero. Um, and it may not be this clean, right? It could be 0.25. It could be 0.75. Ultimately, we want to get strong reading comprehension. We need one times one, right, to equal one. So then this leads into the reading brain. So um, this is a very complex um, process, and I'm going to explain it in extremely um, simple terms as best I can. Um, and learning how a skilled um, reader's brain works really influences how we teach children to read. So the reader will see a printed word. So this is where the orthographic processing occurs. Then the brain makes associations between these graphemes and the phonemes, resulting in knowing those phonemes in the word bat. So we see the word bat, and then we know that the phonemes are b, a, t. So a reader's brain makes these associations between print and sound. So our print area is green and that sound area is blue. And so readers are mapping these visual symbols to speech units. Um, and this is an extremely complex process. I just said it very in very simple terms, but this is a very, very complex process that develops um, that we need to develop. So then after we decode that word bat, the area of the brain that determines meaning so that's this red area. So is this a baseball bat? Is it an animal? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? So these three areas of the brain work seamlessly together, creating something called the reading circuit. So how we get from vision to meaning is called the phonological root, and we need to build this circuit in our children's brains. So the orthographic processing system receives visual input, and we receive information about these printed words. And this is also known as the letterbox or the visual word form area. And this occurs in the occipital lobe. 
The phonological and orthographic systems, they work together with constant interaction, converting those letters to sounds. And this is our phonics skills. So when we're reading print to speech, we are decoding. When we are spelling, we're going speech to print and we're encoding. Then we have the meaning processor and this interprets the meaning of words. So when we read a word, our meaning processor gets activated and we have to comprehend what that word means. So before children come to school, they have naturally learned how to talk. They have learned a lot about meanings of words. Um, so speaking is hardwired into our brains. This circuit right here, connecting that phonological area and the semantic area, um, this is where your language comprehension occurs. We are born with these circuits ready to develop. So that's very different for the reading circuit. It is not natural and we have to build it. So we're not born with this innate um, ability to learn how to read. So speaking is hardwired into the brain, um, but um, it is not that way for reading. Uh, it has to be directly taught through explicit systematic instruction. Um, and so children with dyslexia, they have a great difficulty making connections from vision to sound. So there's a lot of cognitive overload, a lot of frustration that's happening right here between vision and sound. And so the dyslexic brain has difficulty with phoneme processing, sound sensitivity, phoneme awareness. Um, but with explicit instruction, the activation pattern within these areas of the brain can be strengthened, they can be built, and we can work on having them commute autom communicate automatically. And that ultimately is what creates a skilled reader. With that said, I do know when I look at a brain like this and I think about the children that I taught with um, maybe a language impairment, a speech impairment, and a reading difficulty, a reading deficit, think about all the, let's call them like potholes or roadblocks along their circuit. So that just um, explains the need for explicit systematic instruction even more. Um, that they, they still are born with this natural ability to learn it, but they're gonna need explicit instruction to strengthen these connections greatly. So the completed phonological route is your vision to semantic. And then the lexical route is your semantic area to your vision area. And this is where that letterbox is built. It takes years for this to build for a typical reader. Um, and when the entire reading circuit is built and strengthened, this is where we have an automatic reader. Um, it's important to note that when we memorize whole words, um, we're using the right hemisphere, which is good at recognizing pictures, um, but we can only memorize about 300 words. So um, we need to be able to read about 50,000 words. So this is all going on. The reading brain, the reading circuit is in the left hemisphere. So now I would love for you to go into this Jamboard. And um, at the top of a Jamboard, there are, you can click through slides. So this activity is going to be just slides one, two, and three, just in case we ran out of room of sticky notes. But I want you to think about the simple view of reading and what areas you have expertise in. Um, so add, a sticky note, I am an expert in this area and type it out and drag it under either if that area falls under word recognition or if that area falls under um, language comprehension. When I started learning about literacy, I, I realized that I knew a lot about phonemes. I had a lot of knowledge in that area, but I did not know how to teach phonemic awareness, right? So I had these connections and knowledge base, but I just had to figure out how to capitalize on what I already knew. So I want this group to realize that you have um, you have knowledge in these areas. Um, so, so someone wrote word recognition. So they are an expert in knowing how the speech sounds connect to print. So if you click here on the left to a sticky note, 
you can add a sticky note and I could write phonemes was my example and I can make it pink. And then you can drag it wherever you would like. Helping students connect their background knowledge to text. That's a great um, area of expertise within um, language comprehension, semantic knowledge, phonological awareness. Phonological awareness was always tricky for me. That one did not come easy. Ooh, narrative language, that's a great one. Comprehension, syntax, right? Syntax is comprehension. That's right. Phonological knowledge. A lot of semantics. That's fun. Using context clues to aid in comprehension. So these are all areas that speech pathologists are, are, are experts in. And when I think about the simple view of reading, I always am baffled that I didn't learn about the simple view of reading in graduate school. Um, I hope that's changing nowadays because the whole simple view of reading is grounded in language, right? Word recognition and la language comprehension. So, and then also, I also hope that in speech pathology graduate school, I wish the reading brain was part of our um, neuroanatomy classes. I think that would have been amazing to learn as well. There's a lot of brain information on, on the reading brain. Lots of fun brain scans. Okay, so now this next activity, before we jump into dyslexia, we're going to do a dyslexia simulation. So if, um, when you read this passage, you are going to follow the directions displayed in this gray chart. So when you see a Q, you're going to pronounce it as a D or a T. Um, and I'm going to give you one minute to read, okay? So basically the chart is the rules and you're going to basically decode it with these new sound rules. So I'm going to set the timer for one minute so you can just have some quiet time. All right, I'm going to have you stop. And this next slide is the passage that you attempted to read. Um, when I did this in the one minute, I did not even make it through the um, through the first sentence. Um, I got incredibly stuck on the word body um, and the rules of <laughs> um, when the, the rules about the short vowels completely confused me. Um, so I already see some comments in the chat. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and share out or um, type in the type in the chat. How did that make you feel? Did you use any coping strategies? Um, does this remind you of any kids that you work with when they're trying to read?
who gave up. There's a lot of people who gave up, fatiguing, frustrated and stopped. So how do you think this um, relates to a child trying to read our English code, break our English code? Your accuracy was way off. <laughs> Absolutely, Grace. No joy of reading, right? When it's that something like that is so effortful. Absolutely. Felt like a puzzle. So that that is, um, I also once went through a dyslexia simulation on, um, there's a simulation on writing. Um, and then also there was a simulation on math, um, also, and wow, both of them, it was like mental gymnastics for my brain to try to do this. Um, yeah, um, Susan, that's right. Um, it is really, I think, important to put ourselves in our students, um, our students shoes to see how they are experiencing something. Um, yeah, obviously I can see why kids guess at words too, right? Might be a little bit easier or faster and less less stress on my brain. So now that we know what it might um, feel like to experience having word reading difficulties, um, we will jump into the definition a little bit. Um, dyslexia is a reading disorder primarily characterized by word level reading difficulties stemming from phonological processing weaknesses. Um, it is neurobiological. So when I say neurobiological, I'm talking about what's happening in the brain. So when a skilled reader instantly recognizes the printed word, um, the reader has learned to take those letters on the page and translate those letters into phonemes or sounds. Um, the reader is making that connection between spoken sounds and print. So individuals with dyslexia have difficulty with these language processing skills. Um, so these language areas of the brain are in the left hemisphere. They are heavily impacted. Um, I'm very proud um, that our state has this amazing resource, um, the Michigan Dyslexia Handbook. It just came out um, this in 2022, I think August. And um, it is designed to help educators, um, district leaders, school leaders develop a shared understanding of the best practices to prevent reading difficulties. Um, I'm just curious, either drop in the chat or you can use the reaction with thumbs up or thumbs down. Does anybody use this? Has anybody seen this? Um, is this handbook, is it um, getting passed around your district or your county? Thumbs up, Janelle. Janelle, um, how are you guys using it um, as a resource? Are you digging into it as a team? It was shared primarily with our psychologists. Um, I happen to be married to a psychologist who brought it to my attention. <laughs> so I have only been exploring it on my own at this point. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, there's someone else, um, literacy coach brought it up. Um, a school psychologist friend shared it with you, okay. Okay, so this is something that um, is, is very useful. So Rebecca, it is um, on the resource handout that um, was compiled for this professional development. Um, so Lisa will drop that in the chat. Um, and if you, if you Google Michigan Dyslexia Handbook, it will be the first thing that pops up. Um, so it includes, um, assessment practices that are needed to inform instruction and intervention. Um, the focus of the handbook is on learners who are exhibiting, um, characteristics of dyslexia and identified with a word learning disability. Um, it is extremely user-friendly. Um, at the end of each chapter, they have action steps. And the action steps um, suggest how educators and leaders may act upon the handbook, um, the information in the handbook. Um, there's also a section at the end of each chapter called more information. And so it provides links to websites and resources that have a ton of quality information on that chapter topic. 
Um, these are, I would love to see schools doing um, PLCs using this as your as your text for your um, material that you're reading and discussing. You could use this at staff meetings um, with your multidisciplinary team. Um, there's so many activities and um, action steps that can make this really useful um, learning that our, our state of Michigan has um, created for us. Um, it is a really nice resource to expand expand that learning. So I wanted to make sure you had it. Um, so now I'm going to take you guys and let you, I'm going to take a break from talking. I'm going to give you some talk time and we're going to go into breakout rooms and we are going to do a few minutes of collaboration time just to talk about what is your role in a dyslexia evaluation. Um, you can share your glow or what you hope to grow with regards to the dyslexia evaluation process. Um, my, my glow was probably I had pretty good language evaluations. Um, I wish I grew in how to strengthen my phonemic awareness um, evaluations and how that influenced um, a student's reading achievement. That would have been my area of improvement. Um, and if you're not involved in a dyslexia evaluation at your school level, that's okay. It'll be really nice to hear from others, to see if anyone is. Um, and yeah, and you can have a couple minutes to chat. I'll put about four to five people, three to four people in a room. Um, and we'll go for about five minutes. Just say hi and share your experiences. Okay. We're slowly making our way back. Okay. Does anyone want to either share their glow or their grow? or if there was something you wish you could be doing to get more involved in that um, reading evaluation process. 
I'd be really curious to hear your roles. Um, the group that I was in, we were talking about the fact that um, dyslexia isn't necessarily like an IEP category, right? And so, um, you know, frequently as SLPs or special educators, we end up then looking at, you know, that articulation or language comprehension, but then also you, you end up going to basic reading skills. Um, and then, yeah, so we were just kind of talking about how a lot of times some people from like an outside organization might come in and say, oh, yep test for dyslexia, but right now they, I guess it's not how they really phrase it or frame it um, for IEPs. Right. Um, learning disability. And then it has a variety of areas in reading, right? Yep. Thank you, Kate. Anyone else? We had a very similar discussion. And uh, one thing that I volunteered was that um, in regards to phonemic awareness, I, I was often testing a lot for it, but then would get this information and not know what to do with it, um, but knew how important it was and like helping coach the resource room teacher to figure out when they could provide the service and support because as SLPs were so challenged with our time too. So figuring out where on the spectrum the support should be given and by who and understanding the skills too was challenging. Those are huge questions. Who should be giving the support, right? Because there's a lot of overlap um, between professions, especially when it comes to literacy. Um, so I do think collaboration is key, right? Work smarter, not harder. Thanks, Mallory, for sharing that. Okay, so we are about halfway and I want to make sure I give you a break to use the restroom and stand up a little bit. So as soon as we come back um, in seven minutes, we are going to jump in to everybody's favorite. I'm an SLP. How can I help? Okay. So we are going to take a break. So feel free to take a minute and stretch or use the bathroom. We'll see you back in about seven minutes. Okay, everybody, welcome back. I hope you took a little stretch break. And now for the best part, right, you guys? Um, we want to know how we can help. I'm a speech pathologist. How do I get a little bit more involved in literacy? Um, here are going to be a little bit, a couple of ideas to tap into your existing knowledge to intentionally support literacy skills of your students, ideas, routines to enhance what you're already doing, small tweaks um, to add some literacy to your existing routines. I want us to be working smarter, not harder. Um, <clears throat> this is a nice chart from ASHA's Language in Brief. Um, it connects the domains of language and how they relate to reading. Um, we, you know, have limited time, about an hour left. Um, so we're going to, the examples that I'm going to touch on are related to phonology, syntax, and semantics. Um, and this language and brief article is in the resource handout. But before we get into the phonology example, I want to touch on problem solving. Um, so speech language pathologists are almost always part of some type of teaming structure. So this um, may be through participation on your building leadership team, department team, um, a multidisciplinary team. So we are on these teams to share the responsibility of data systems and practices. Um, but how can we be more impactful in these discussions? Um, we can improve our participation in these meetings by using the simple view of reading to frame our involvement in these conversations. So with our knowledge of the simple view of reading and the reading brain, to be honest, our questions and participation on these teams provide that dynamic perspective that really is needed to make database decisions. Um, the background knowledge of how reading develops really can guide um, the data that needs to be collected, the data that needs to be analyzed, or even request the data that might be missing. 
um, without a strong foundation in understanding how a child learns to read, um, how they acquire language and literacy skills, our participation on these teams is a little bit more limited. Without that knowledge, we're, we're less productive in problem solving for our students. Um, this, this makes me think of ASHA's position statement at the very beginning of the webinar, where it mentions advocacy. So these team meetings are a really nice place where speech pathologists can also advocate for effective literacy practices and then advance that, um, that knowledge base in literacy. So we are going to do another Jamboard activity. So if you click on the link in the Jamboard, we're going to go to slide five. So at the top, you can scroll over. But before you jump into the Jamboard, let's just talk about the activity first. So what I, what I want you to do is think we're in a problem solving meeting and we have this scenario. So we have a beginning second grade student, but they're reading at the end of kindergarten level. They have poor spelling, but pretty good scores on a spelling test. They follow classroom routines and directions, no behavior concerns, and uses pretty general vocabulary. So in the Jamboard, I want you to really, really think about the simple view of reading and guide and let that guide your questioning. We know that the simple view of reading guides us in what to teach and what to assess. So we can, one, shift our language to what instruction is needed, what assessment is needed. This can steer us away from language grounded in student deficits. Um, and it can help us influence the type of questions that we're going to ask. So, you know, in order to, to solve a problem, we have to be asking good questions. So whenever anyone comes to me, um, personally, my, my, um, my friend's children, my niece and nephew, anyone who asks me a consulting question on a student's um, learning abilities or reading abilities, I think in my head, what do I know about word recognition for this student? What do I know about language comprehension in this student, about this student? All of my questions are falling under those two buckets, right? So what I would love for us is to jump into that Jamboard and ask some questions that you would be asking that fall under those two categories. Um, what is some of the data that you might need? Um, I will give one example and then I will stop talking so you can take a minute and add a sticky, but a lot of times um, teachers will bring a NWEA score to a meeting like this, right? And let's say the student is beginning of second grade. So this is going to be a K2 NWEA score. So what I know as a teacher about that is that that's a receptive measure. So what I also know about the simple view of reading and literacy skills is that phonemic awareness and decoding under that word recognition bucket are expressive skills. So they have given me what maybe they they might assume is like their reading score, their reading level, their reading, but that's that's not really enough information. I need an expressive phonemic awareness score. I need an expressive decoding measure. So then I'm going to have that conversation and I'm going to guide them on what additional data I need to get a clearer picture of what instruction needs to happen, what um, what assessment needs to happen so we can effectively problem solve for this student. So I'm going to jump in the Jamboard. Let's scroll over to slide five. And if any of these questions are helpful to you, I would um, I would take a screenshot. What is story retail like? If this text is read aloud, can they retell the story with details and accuracy? Oral, oral narrative retail. Good. A lot of questions about. Um, what their comprehension is like if 
we are reading the story to them. So that is where we as speech pathologists really understand the difference between reading comprehension and listening comprehension, oral comprehension and written comprehension. Complex or simple um, sentence structure. How are you measuring that reading level, right? What does that look like? What instructional scaffolds are used in, to assist the student in decoding an unknown word? That is a beautiful discussion of instructional, instructional um, interventions, right? Under that word recognition bucket. Sometimes I felt when I was at those team meetings that it would be easier for me just to evaluate the student because I sometimes didn't feel like I knew what else to do. And I knew those language assessments were super concrete and I would get a solid answer. Um, but knowing about the simple view of reading and the reading brain, I have a better framework for what connections are we trying to build? What connections aren't built yet? Great job. These are great questions. If any of these are helpful to you, I do recommend just taking a screenshot or jotting a couple down. Okay, now we'll get into phonology. So I'm going to tell a quick little story first about phonemic awareness. So I was a school-based speech pathologist where I had an office and saw the kids pretty much um, pull out style. And then when I got the job as a classroom SLP teacher, um, all my children needed phonemic awareness instruction. And my mom is actually a special education teacher, teaches literacy. And um I, she was like, your kids absolutely need phonemic awareness. And I was like, I don't really know how to do that. What does that look like? Like every single day. And she genuinely was surprised that I was a speech pathologist and didn't understand how to teach phonemic awareness. So we sat at the kitchen counter and I went to my parents' house and we sat at the kitchen counter and my mom helped me, um, write a phonemic awareness lesson plan that I could use every single day for my classroom. Um, and then slowly, then I start digging into some phonemic awareness resources, phonemic awareness webinars, and you build your skills, but it's easy to learn when we are speech pathologists and we have such a solid foundation in language, in phonology. Um, so if that is you, don't worry, it was me too. And we always have room to grow. Um, I read this article last summer and I felt like Jennifer Ferlito was like, they were writing about me as a speech pathologist. Um, I was so sad, but um, this was done in 2020 and these researchers explored the persistence of reading risk for students um, following one year of speech intervention. So these children had speech sound disorders and they did a year of speech therapy and 33 children who had speech sound disorders were at reading risk at the beginning of the year. And then at the end of the year, 21 of those students remained at reading risk following their school-based speech therapy. Um, their speech did improve, their speech was remediated, but 21 students still remained at reading risk. <clears throat> And so that made me, it just made me think of me, how many preschool students did I serve um, where I was able to remediate their speech sound disorder, but they were probably at the same amount of reading risk um, because I did not um, incorporate any literacy focused activities embedded in their speech therapy. Um, and so at the end of this article, they reflect on a 2010 study that summarize that many speech pathologists are uncomfortable working on literacy within the context of therapy. 
So this um, article is in your resource handout if you're interested. Um, I just, you know, wish I could go back to that preschool caseload and um, do my intervention a tiny bit differently. This is also something that Honestly, I'm a little embarrassed to say it out loud, but I think it's fine. I didn't really know the difference between phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. And I felt like a lot of people, speakers, presenters, were using these terms as synonyms interchangeably. Um, and so it isn't until I got really deep into reading that I was like, oh, they're different. Um, so I just want to highlight these terms um, here as a group um, that phonological awareness is a lot of times you see this in the umbrella image, right? It is the big umbrella. Um, and so the alliteration, syllable, onset, rhyme, and rhyme, these are um, really good activities to support children in preschool and begin in kindergarten um, to develop that phonological sensitivity, um, the ability to listen to language, but they are not precursors to phonemic awareness over here, right? So phonemic awareness is a phonological awareness skill along with these, um, but these skills, these phonological awareness skills are not precursors to phonemic awareness. So phonological awareness is all levels of the sound system. Phonemic awareness is where we get into the individual sound level. So mastering the phonological awareness skills with syllables, rhyming words is not a necessary step to get to the phonemic awareness level. Um, phonemic awareness level is the ability to manipulate phonemes, and this is what best supports the alphabetic principle. So these larger units um, of sound play are really good in preschool and early kindergarten um, to get kids' ears like tuned in to hearing language, um, and um, they're really supporting that phonological sensitivity, listening to language. It's great. Once we get to mid kindergarten, we have to be working at that individual phoneme level um, to prepare kids to read and spell. So the examples I'm going to give are going to be at the phoneme level. So they are phonemic awareness activities. So I just think this is, we can't say this enough times in my opinion, because I, I genuinely thought that people used these terms interchangeably. So phonemic awareness, the ability to isolate, um, segment, blend, and manipulate phonemes. So it is believed to facilitate a child's ability to link speech sounds to printed letters and letter combinations. And it is the basis for word reading and spelling. So basically, that phoneme awareness, that ability to um, say individual phonemes and words, pull them apart, put them back together. This is what's enabling kids to learn how to read and spell. Um, this is an expressive task. Um, when children receive this explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, it's gonna occur in daily small doses. Um, it's going to improve their ability to read familiar and unfamiliar words. Um, letters reinforce and support that phonemic awareness once students have learned to auditorily attend to sounds. So teaching sounds and that those sounds represent letters as you're talking about tongue placement, um, tongue movement, mirror work, connecting your speech therapy to literacy, all of these things can happen at the same time. So if I want a student to become aware of individual phonemes, I may start with phoneme segmentation. Um, this is an example of a activity where you're at the individual phoneme level. Um, so phoneme segmentation helps students identify and separate phonemes that are bonded to graphemes. So segmenting is that warm up for encoding. Um, in this example, a student could segment their target word into individual phonemes. Um, students can tap with their fingers. They can slide them up with chips. Um, so Lisa, do you want to um, unmute and we can just run through a quick example of this? Sure. So say cab. Cab. I'm going to say the sounds in cab. It's my turn. K -a -b. Now it's your turn. Say cab. Cab. Tell me the sounds in cab. K -a -b. 
Good. And then if let's say um, Lisa's target sound was initial K, I would be really, really um, careful that I'm doing my or, you know, maybe I'm not touching those chips. Maybe I'm doing my um, visual cues, ab, whatever um, cueing system you may use, right? And I may highlight, oh, that first sound, I need your mouth wide open, right? If they are doing um, final consonant deletion, I may point to that last chip. Oh, I didn't hear that sound. I need to hear all three sounds, ab. What's the whole word? Cab, right? So just incorporating phoneme segmentation into the articulation words that you're already doing. Um, this is a nice visual of how you can segment words um, by sliding the token into the box for each sound. For every sound they hear, the token goes into an empty box. Um, I did this as like a warm up um, before we did our speech, um, like our speech game, let's say, whatever your articulation game was. And then also when you are adding in um, the letters, you are strengthening that area in phonology as you're linking phonology to orthography when we're introducing those letters. Um, and then there's blending. So blending is that warm up for decoding. So um, a couple things about blending, continuous consonants are easier to blend than stop consonants. Um, and that is a fun fact that a speech pathologist understands that if you have a student who is maybe on the special education caseload, um, getting brought up at the student assistant meeting and has difficulty with blending, you could suggest, maybe they're not even on your caseload, that the that the teacher starts doing some blending activities with continuous sounds, because that's going to maybe be a little bit easier. That could be a tiny scaffold that this kid may need. Um, so continuous sounds are easier than stop sounds. Um, when introducing those stop sounds, we want them to appear at the end of a word, like web or had. Um, cause when that stop sound is at the end of a word, it helps the students learn that correct phoneme production without that schwa at the end. Um, and then connected phonation and continuous blending, that's going to help promote decoding more quickly. Um, so if I were to do a, um, if I was doing speech articulation with a group, um, we always usually work with some pile of articulation cards, right? Um, before they earned their 10 cards for our activity, I would do um, a blending activity. So Lisa, I'm going to say some sounds slowly, and then you're going to say them fast, okay? And if you get the word right, you get to earn your card, okay? Okay. Sounds good. Ish. What word? Ish. Fish. You got it. So then I would show them the card, you got it right, and I'd give it to them. But I will say, if F is their target and they said pish, right, I'm going to say, oh, you did get that word right. You, I know you know it's a fish, but this time when you say it, I want your, your teeth on your bottom lip, fish, right? So try again. I'm going to say it slow. You're going to say it fast, but this time with your best speech ish fish fish good job with your at the beginning <laughs> um same thing with um final consonant deletion right so then you could earn they can earn all of their articulation sounds all their articulation cards i'm sorry um through a quick blending activity um, this is extremely difficult for the students that I had. I actually used the Kaufman box and I loved it because of the scope and sequence of complexity. And I had to go all the way back to vowel consonant and consonant vowel um, for blending. And then I would show them the card. That was a very, very difficult task for some students. Um, thank you, Lisa, for showing that. Um, the next thing that I want to explore is just understanding the relationship between phonemes and graphemes um, and letters. It is extremely important that we understand this and that um, we can help teachers understand this. So spreading that knowledge of correct phoneme production is vital. And then um, also um, understanding the difference between phonemes, graphemes, and letters. So when I talk about phoneme production, I really mean not adding that 
ah uh, at the end of sounds. So t, p, right? Not ta, pa. We don't want that ah uh, at the end because what is a? Uh? Uh, is a vowel sound, right? So that is going to show up in their writing. It's going to impact their blending. And genuinely, it's a negative impact on their accuracy and automaticity. Um, and we're building ineffective neural pathways when we're adding extra sounds. So we really, really want to be sure that we are um, snipping that schwa off of productions. Um, and then with regards to graphemes, Oftentimes, there's the same number of phonemes and graphemes, but not always, right? So in the word fox, X is one grapheme, but it's two phonemes, right? K -s. So graphemes and phonemes are critical to learning to read words and understanding the differences is critical for educators who are teaching reading. And this is a very important um, learning opportunity that speech paths have expertise in that we can help our, um, our educators with. And then we have um, this awesome graphic from Sordagories. Um, it defines both components of language and it illustrates their interconnectedness among all the different layers of language. So it's important to consider each of these components has both an oral and a print component. So when doing articulation therapy, um, it's important to dig in language wise. So wherever appropriate, incorporating word study into therapy routines, um, the more likely you are to know a word, um, the more likely you're able to read it and spell it accurately and automatically. So um, this is referred to lexical quality. If you are in letters training, um, they talk about lexical quality um, in the letters training. So it's basically the richness of how well you know a word via all the layers of language. So if we were to walk through an example, if the word is cast, we know um, that cast, that sound symbol relationship, um, it has four sounds, k, a, s. And those can be those mapping sounds can be mapped on two letters to read and spell. Um, we know that cast is one syllable. You can have students say the word cast and have them feel that tactile. How often is their chin going down? I think it's a little bit easier to hum the word. <laughs> how many hums is how many syllables? Um, then when we're thinking about semantics, is that a noun? Is it a verb? Using that um, to expand their um, knowledge of word meaning. Um, and then with morphology, um, casting has that inflectional ending. Um, the prefixes sub and un, that changes the meaning of the word. And then word order, which is syntax. So how um, word order impacts meaning. Um, the position of a word impact in the sentence dictates its job in the sentence. So how, um, how syntax can play a role in meaning. So cast a spell, cast is the verb. Or if we were to say spell cast, spell is the verb. So we really, um, we really want to be teaching um, how syntax can, you know, change the meaning of a word. And I actually would have started with phonology, which is how many sounds and then mapping those sounds onto symbols. Um, so those are the activities that are little tweaks that you could do to your um, speech articulation activities. Um, if there was a literacy activity that you are currently doing in your practice that's going well, I would love for you to share it in the um to share it in the chat, just so we can share with others what you're doing that is successful. Um, or if there's one of these activities that would be easiest for you to incorporate in your articulation activities, I would love to see that in the chat as well.
Mm, maximally opposed pairs. That's nice, Grace. Good. Rhyming. Yeah, Rachel. Um, Rachel says it'd be easy to incorporate that warm up with phoneme segmentation or blending before starting the activity. That's kind of how I did it. I would like earn, they would earn their cards for the day and then we would jump into our game. Minimal pairs gets, um, yeah, so that's really, really well with um, phony manipulation. Um, just remember that once we get to mid kindergarten, we really want to somehow incorporate the individual phoneme level. If they are younger than mid kindergarten, um, the phonological awareness activities are great um, to get them tuned into language. But once we get to that mid kindergarten, we really want to be starting at that um, individual phoneme level just to prime them and get them going for reading and writing. Thank you for sharing. This next section is going to be on vocabulary. So once a student has learned to decode printed words, um, Vocabulary is the single best predictor of reading comprehension. So that is pretty powerful. Um, we're going to focus um, just on two areas of the read aloud routine um, that we can use with our SLI students. So um, vocabulary and then questioning. So when incorporating read alouds um, into our instructional routines, we really want to avoid picking a book for a read aloud the same day that you're going to teach it. Um, we want to avoid dealing with comprehension issues as they arise um, that on the fly, we really do want to avoid that. So I did include in your handout a variety of read aloud resources. Um, we don't have time to go through the whole read aloud routine, but I wanted you to have um, a structure to follow. So within those read aloud routines, I just picked out vocabulary and questioning because I thought they were really applicable to many speech pathologists. But a full read aloud routine, the structure of that is really beneficial. So I want you to know that that is in your resource handout. Um, so when choosing books, we want it to be high quality. Um, we need to ask ourselves, does that book have a long lasting value? Is it related to concepts we are learning in other subject areas? Are there several layers of meaning? Um, does it include unusual vocabulary? that um, that builds on student knowledge. So we're going to go into a breakout room and we're gonna teach a vocabulary word and we are going to assume that we are the teacher or that the teacher has chosen a high quality text. Um, and we are gonna assume that we have followed all of the requirements in a good read aloud lesson. So we are gonna go into breakout rooms and we're gonna teach the word relieved. So before I tell you how to teach a vocabulary word, I want you just to give your best effort. So you don't necessarily have to like run a lesson plan, but when you're in your group, talk about what elements you would choose when teaching a new word, okay? And so I will send you to breakout rooms to teach the word um, relieved and we'll come back in about four minutes. Okay, welcome back. We just have a couple more people. Always fun to see everybody trickle back in. Okay, so how would we teach what? Oh, sorry, I thought someone was trying to chat. So how would we teach the word 
um, relieved. So Anita Archer um, is very, very well known for her work in explicit instruction. I highly recommend her book, Explicit Instruction. Um, she outlines a very explicit routine for teaching vocabulary. So that is the routine we will go through today. Um, there are four steps. So introducing the words um, pronunciation, the words meaning, illustrating with examples and non-examples if appropriate, and then checking for understanding. So Lisa and I are just going to run through a quick routine um, of how maybe someone may teach the word relieved. So Lisa, today um, we are going to be learning the word relieved. What word are we going to learn, Lisa? Relieved. Yes, relieved. I'm going to tap and say the syllables in relieved. My turn. Relieved. Your turn. Can you say the syllables in relieved? Relieved. Yes. Again. Relieved. Yes. Relieved. What word are we doing today? Relieved. Yes. Relieved. When something is difficult is over, when something difficult is over, or it never happened at all, you might feel relieved. So if something that is difficult is over, you would feel relieved. Yes, relieved. Um, watch me. If I'm feeling relieved, it might look like this. Ooh. What would it look like if you were to feel relieved? Ooh. Yes. So when a difficult spelling test is over, you feel relieved. Yes, relieved. Um, okay, Lisa, I'm going to ask you some questions about being relieved, okay? And you tell me yes or no. So if you were really nervous singing in front of an audience, would you feel relieved when that concert was over? Yes. Yes, you would feel relieved. Why would you feel relieved? I don't really like to get up in front of everybody and sing. Yes. So when that difficult thing is over, whew, you would feel relieved. Okay, Lisa, if you loved singing in front of an audience, would you feel relieved if it was over? Hmm. Maybe. No. I mean, if you, if you really love it, are you going to be like super relieved and less stressed out when it's done? No. Mm -mm. No, why not? Because I would, I would want to keep going. I would want to keep doing that. You might feel excited for the next time you got to sing in front of an audience, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would. One time I was relieved when I was driving to work and there was no traffic on the road at all. And I had a very easy drive to work. I was so relieved that I wasn't late. Was there ever a time that you were relieved? Yes. My dog ran away. And when we finally found him, I was so relieved. Mm, that was a big relief, I bet. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, Lisa. So that is just a very, very quick um, example of the steps that you would run through to teach a vocabulary word. And so now I just want to stretch your thinking a little bit, um, not only to language, but what about social language lessons? So we just taught the word relieved. So what little tweaks could we be making to have that related to our pragmatic language lesson? How are you feeling? How would someone else be feeling? We're teaching a lot of vocabulary in social language lessons. And what if we just put an explicit framework around our teaching? That would really, really connect that literacy lens to that work. Um, if anyone is willing to share, I'm just curious when you taught that word in your breakout room, was there a step that you absolutely missed that you didn't even know was important to include, or do you feel like this is pretty common knowledge for teaching vocabulary? I know some people are Anita, Anita Archer fans. Mm. Syllabication. Step one. Um, Lauren, you asked the author's name. Um, I think you mean to um, the explicit instruction book. The author is Anita Archer and um, Charles Hughes. 
Susan got all of the steps right out of the gate. Good job. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So if we just incorporate some explicit instruction framework while teaching vocabulary, it can go a long way. Um, and so the last area that we are going to um, go through is questioning. <laughs> um, so questioning. So this is a big one. So how many times I feel like every single person in this room knows that we all have had IEPs and speech and language goals around questioning. Um, we've written them. All of our students usually have this as a need. Um, so if we make this shift from WH questions to text-dependent questions, it allows for students to achieve a deep understanding of text um, rather than per questions about personal experiences or opinions. So we want to ask questions that allow students to make connections between who is doing what and why they are doing it. Um, so this, you know, think about WH questions, um, traditional WH questions, how they could be a little bit ambiguous, right? Um, they assume a little bit of lived experience and exposure. So um, Lisa and I were chatting about this and we were talking about like, who delivers the mail? Um, that might not be um, familiar to a student who lives in an apartment complex or a housing situation where a mail carrier is never seen. So this is a really simple tweak that can turn questioning into a rich literacy building opportunity. And then after questioning, you can take that and bridge it to syntax. So we can take this instruction of questioning further by filling out a sentence building chart and you build in that syntax instruction. Based off the chart on the previous slide, you can put some of those answers on sticky notes and build a sentence with them. And so you can answer the who or the what, um, the where, the when, and then have the students build these sentences. Um, and then you have comprehension and syntax at work at the same time, all based off the text that you're discussing, right? So this is all meaningful because it's hopefully connected to the text that they're working on, that they're learning in one of their content areas or um, in the literature that they are reading maybe for their language art lessons. So this is a great video of syntax instruction, um, very early um, kindergarten syntax lesson, and she's using it on note cards. So I'm going to play this. Um, I want to make sure my sound is shared, so I'm just going to reshare. And we'll play this just for the first three minutes. This one? Do everybody make this gesture? Look, they're all right here too, with the letters that it goes with. So today, now that you're warmed up, you know what our vowels say, right? You're not going to have a difficult time reading these words. So. I'm going to have you read some words. You have to decide if the word that you're reading tells me who, so that means it could be a person, a place, or a thing, or an animal, or does it tell me an action? Is my word an action word that I'm reading? All right, so let's read this first word together. Oh, let's find, I see our, well, that was fast. Is run, is that a who, or is that something we do? Do. It's something we do. Can you put it under the do column, please? Okay, is it a who or is it something we do? Can you hop, make your fingers hop? You can, if you can make it happen, it's something that you do. All right, 
All right, so now we have who's and we have do's. And in order to make a sentence, you have to have a who and a do. You get to choose who you want to talk about and what they're going to do. And we're going to start off our sentence where we're going to say with a capital letter. With a capital letter. So now say this. The frog swims. Good. You want to use it? Pull that over. All right. And look what you said swims. And that's so great. Guess what I have? I have your S there because we don't say the frog swim. We say the frog swims. And then what do I have to, what do you think is on my last card? Period. All right, can you say your sentence now? Go ahead and the say it. The frog swims. Okay. Have your students say it. You're the teacher. Say it. Okay, everybody, say the sentence. Okay, everybody, say the sentence. The frog swims. Okay. Now, can you add to it for me? Can you tell me where he swims? Who could tell me where he swims? In the pond. In the pond? Yeah. Okay, let me put these out. In the pond. Good. Let's read that sentence now. Ready? Go. The frog swims in the pond. I'm going to change it to this. Now what does the sentence say? Read the sentence to me. The frog swims. And let's go back to in the pond. Let's change it to, not just in the pond, let's change it to in the big, you want it to be big or little? Big. big. The big pond. Okay. Ready? Go ahead. The frog swims in the big pond. Now. Um, I love that um, video because I love the excitement of the kids, especially when she allows the little girl to be the teacher and she says, you, you say it and you be the teacher, read the sentence. Um, but that's a nice way we can get, um, hopefully that syntax lesson is based off of their text that they're reading, right? Then you're getting, you're hitting all of these um, spots all at the same time, getting more bang for your buck, right? Um, so before we end, I am going to give you a little bit of time to um, have this evaluation link of today's session. So I mentioned before, but we have a little bit of a competition going on at our work at the Technical Assistance Center, um, whoever can get the most evaluations. So I really would appreciate um, your feedback, um, one, for the contest, but also because I genuinely do um, appreciate and value your feedback. Um, I would love to have more um, speech language pathology offerings through the TA Center. So I would love to know what you thought about this one, if it was helpful, um, and I would love to know um, how we can continue helping um, speech pathologists statewide through the TA Center. So feel free to grab this QR code and do it while we're just wrapping up these last couple of slides. Um, so next steps um, are really just what we're gonna end on. Um, but if I could go back to my days as an elementary speech path, um, I think I would really get comfortable with either a vocabulary routine or a read aloud instruction routine. And I would get comfortable in my office with my group of kids, really perfecting that routine, getting confident with it. And then I would partner with a general education teacher and I would pick someone I'm really friends with, someone that I eat lunch with, someone who I am very, very comfortable and have a good working relationship with. And hopefully I have a couple of kids in her class on my caseload, but I would start teaching it, co-teaching it with that partner. So get really good, com comfortable with something in your own room and then bridge out and partner with a colleague. And then just imagine if we had explicit instruction 
going on in our gen ed classrooms, or if we had explicit instruction for phonemic awareness in our general education classrooms. What if you became an expert and confident in phonemic awareness with your caseload in your office, and then you went into general education kindergarten and did a 10 minute lesson to model and provide education for that general education teacher. That is how we can spread the knowledge and get more evidence-based instruction for our students more widespread across classrooms. Um, so I would love for you to think about one idea that you could implement into an existing routine that maybe you could get really good with in your own setting, and then maybe you could partner with a friend and extend that practice into another classroom. Um, as you reflect, I want you to think about what you want to start doing, stop doing, and keep doing. Um, I was at a um, conference and they asked these questions and they were really thought provoking for me. It said like, what are you doing that's working? And what are you doing that's not working? What is What are you doing that is not getting the outcome that you were hoping for? Um, and that's really reflective um, and how we can um, tweak our own practice to increase those outcomes. Um, we do know that the likelihood of writing something down um, increases that we will implement it. So it increases that implementation. So I encourage you just to write yourself a sticky note, star one of the pages on the handout that is applicable to you and your practice. Um, and then I just want to say thank you for your time today. I really enjoyed having you all here. Um, I've had previous coworkers and colleagues and classmates all on this um, webinar. So it's been really fun to have such a collaborative group of speech paths all together. Um, I encourage you to visit the Technical Assistance Center website. It's at the top. And then um, they do have a Facebook page, a Twitter and YouTube channel. I would say the YouTube channel has the best resources. There's so many wonderful webinars um, on the um, TA Center YouTube channel. So I absolutely recommend taking a peek at the YouTube channel. Um, and then if you want to stay up to date with offerings, um, you can join um, the listserv. Um, and then obviously feel free to reach out if you have any questions um, at all. Um, it was really lovely having everybody here. Thank you so much.